Hello all, Sagar and Jetty here and Marshall Kosloff. Welcome back to The Realignment. This week, we speak with Megan McArdle, a columnist at The Washington Post. Megan's long been a defender of capitalism and markets in the pages of The Economist, The Atlantic, and Bloomberg View. Megan makes the reasoned case for capitalism and markets in a time when both the left and the right are offering up their own critiques of capitalism. Borrowing from Winston Churchill, she says it's the worst way to design an economy, except for everything else that's been tried. This episode offers a free market perspective on the emerging questions of free trade, regulation of big tech, the challenges facing local journalism, and more. And we especially emphasize the complexity of our economic system, how we should take a hard look before asking the government to intervene. Let's get to it. Megan McArdle, welcome to The Realignment. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So the reason that we wanted to have you on here is because you wrote a spirited defense of markets recently while also acknowledging much of the challenges that's facing capitalism. Right now, we're in a time where both the left and the right, they're increasingly skeptical of free markets' ability to create a good society. And I think that the reason why what you wrote was so relevant was you're talking about how most of the prosperity we see, right, the living standards, the scooters, the Ubers, But also just basic technology like the iPhone are enabled by markets. Um, And if we look to the future, if we imagine a world that's prosperous, that prosperity is going to be due to markets as well, too. Um, So I think it's really be helpful for the audience for you to restate the case that you're making for those markets. Sure. Um, Look, uh, markets are a little bit like Winston Churchill's defense of democracy. (laughs) 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 They're they're, They're worse except for all the other possible systems. And I think that that's true. But no, I will always state the positive case for markets, which is that um, I think it's actually best put by Friedrich Hayek, who did a wonderful essay on uh, say something, some calamity happens and half the world's tin is destroyed. And what then happens is that, you know, people don't even have to know that this happened, that this mine collapse has cut off the supply of tin. Um, What will happen is that slowly the price will rise. And that as if by magic, the people who don't have such valuable uses for tin will stop using it. They'll substitute to something else. And the people who value it the most will get the tin. They'll pay a higher price for it because, in fact, there's real scarcity. And, and, and so what markets do is they kind of magically, seamlessly allocate resources more efficiently than basically any other mechanism. If you think about the difference between that and what would happen in the Soviet central planning system where the committee would have to get together and decide who got the tin and there would be all of this bureaucratic infighting and it wouldn't be based on how much people want the end use of the tin. It would be based on who has you know, pull over the guy in the nomenclatura <laughs> who, um, and so in fact, markets do this one thing incredibly well. They allocate uses to their highest valued use. And usually when we are complaining about markets, what we're complaining about is that the people in the markets don't value the things we think they should value. And so think of something like the minimum wage, right? What The reason that people get paid low wages is that the demand for their labor is low relative to the supply of that labor. There are a lot of people who can do a job flipping burgers, mm-hmm. um, and people just aren't willing to pay that much money to buy a McDonald's quality hamburger, right? And so because of that, the the that mismatch between supply and demand basically pushes the price down. We don't think... And I'm not saying this is wrong, by the way. Yeah. I'm saying that, that we have an intuition that like there should be a basic level below which people just aren't worth less than that, even if the marginal product of their labor isn't quite worth, say, it's $15 an hour, say, it's $10 an hour, say, it's $0.02 cents an hour, whatever your number is. Everyone has a number below which we think that people shouldn't have to work. You shouldn't have to slave for two two cents an hour, right? That would be undignified and pointless. And I think the question is, is about making, you know, this, this current thing is about making the case for the market, which is how do we balance that with the uncomfort, and I think rightfully so uncomfort, of reducing a person to the worth of their wage within that labor, like let's say in a in a, in a minimum wage type job. Or the tendency right. in market fueled societies to reduce the sort of assessment of a society's well-being to GDP growth, right? That says that, okay, we hit 4% this year, so things are great, which 
leads to the obvious critique that GDP growth and sort of tax rates and basically the way the economy is functioning often isn't the best measure or the only complete measure of whether society is successful. Right. That, I mean, I mean, that's absolutely true. And I think the, the, the best kind of high, you know, abstract left critique of the market is that ultimately institutions are made for man, not man for the institutions, mm-hmm. right? And so when you say, well, um, corporations have – Say the argument about women's about women's working hours making it hard for them to balance having family responsibilities right. and so forth, right? And what people say, and this is true, is that if you are not at the office as much, you are less valuable to your company than someone who is at the the office more, right? There's actually experience up until about your mid fifties. Gaining more experience makes you a more valuable employee. And there's no way to, to trade that off, right? If you spend fewer hours at the office because you're spending more time raising kids, then you're not as valuable to your company, especially in these very high-end professional um, organizations where, you know, like if you're a, a high-end banker or a lawyer, you have to be at the office 16 hours a day. And mm-hmm. that's not because the partners want it. It's because the clients demand it. Yes. Um, that said... Right, the counterargument to that, and I think that this has some weight, and that we need to have a model of of the market that takes account of this, is that like ultimately the purpose of corporations is not to have corporations just kind of mindlessly producing widgets and maximizing cash. The purpose is to have a good society that we all want to live in, and if we have a society where women can't um, have families, have to choose between work and families, that's a bad society. And okay, well, let's rethink this. Um, But then you get into the question of how do we rethink this? Is the answer to have the government step in and mandate certain outcomes? And if you look at the trade-off that other countries have made, so say Scandinavia is usually given as the example of what the U.S. should aspire to. Social democracy. Mm -hmm. But especially, but particularly on the gender front, right? Um, I mean, they have extremely high female workforce participation. Uh, rates that are basically parallel with male workforce participation rates, which is unusual. And mm. in, in almost no country in the world is that true, except for Scandinavia. But interestingly, they have fewer managers, female managers, than the U.S. does. And that's because there's a real split in Scandinavia between where women work. I mean, there's a split everywhere, but like women very much tend to work for the government. They tend to work for lower paid, more secure jobs. They tend to work per- part time. And there ultimately still is that trade-off. If you didn't work that many hours, if you, know, if you took five years off in the middle of your career, that's five years of experience you don't have. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that raising children is not socially valuable, it's not that you, but it's not necessarily valuable to, say, the hospital that employs you as a nurse, mm-hmm. right? And so um, that's a, you look at, well, the government's come in and they've said, you know, they've mandated equal paternity leave, they've done all of these mandates. Um, but ultimately, giving mandating that women have extraordinarily generous maternity leave actually also ended up creating incentives for women to end up not gaining the experience and actually not having as many management positions. So there's a trade off. There's a trade off there, right? There's, and, no, and, there's no free lunch. Here and, and, I, I think the point of the trade off is really important. But I think the the higher question is, is what you were alluding to, which is you know it's not always a good idea for the government to get involved. But then the converse of that is what force is big enough than the government to mandate corporations or the market to values things through our institutions, a.k.a. politics. We decide what we value and what not, and we enforce those actions through our system. What, what, how are you thinking through that question? Well, look, it is ultimately true. I think there's a kind of naive libertarianism that says just government needs to get out of the way. Right? <laughs> so, no, in fact, markets are created by legal frameworks. And you see this in all sorts of ways. Like, right, like I defy anyone to come up with a libertarian theory of water rights. Right? Yeah, it, right. It's just, yeah. it's really complicated. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, for all the listeners, um, email us if you, yes. if you can find Um I mean, look, like, there are libertarian influenced theories of water rights but in fact this is just super complicated and there's no kind of like well this is my land and i can do what i want on my land right no there's stuff under your land and it goes on other people's lands and 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 this is really complicated and so you end up with much with a much less than the simplistic like this is mine you you can't touch what's mine model um or take something like antitrust is um 
libertarians love to argue that cartels, you don't need to do trust busting because cartels tend to break up on their own. What's a cartel? A cartel is when a, a group of people in a, in a common industry, OPEC is a cartel, mm-hmm. right? You get together and you, you collude to reduce supply, to raise prices, to make everything cozy and nice for you, right? Um, and they do tend to implode. And the reason they tend to implode is that people cheat. Uh, right? If you've got a cartel and they're raising the price, the ideal thing for you is to produce as much as you can while everyone else restricts their production, their production, and then you pump out as much as you can, get the higher price, and, and benefit. And the problem is everyone does that, and then the price collapses, and it doesn't work very well. But as Eugene Volokh once pointed out, that's because cartel contracts are legally unenforceable. If they were legally enforceable, they would work really well, right? We made a legal choice that we don't want cartels, that that's not how we see markets. When did we and make that, that choice? Uh, in, the, in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Um, and we made that legal choice precisely because, yes, in some sense that's a market, but it's a bad market. It's a malfunctioning market, and we need to think about rules that make markets function better and to the betterment of as many people as possible and not ones that allow people to amass this kind of outside power. Um, and so, yeah, we've made all sorts of choices. And I think a lot of this is just bankruptcy is another example, right, where a lot of libertarians don't like bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is great. <laughs> it's yeah. really necessary. Well, well why exactly? Uh, yeah. So for a few reasons. So the first is that um, the way bankruptcy started was not actually to benefit the debtors. It's to benefit the creditors. And the reason that, that they start having formal bankruptcy proceedings is that what had happened before is, say there's someone who owes a lot of money all around town. Very popular with, say, the British aristocracy in, in 1810, <laughs> right? And say they're insolvent. The first creditor who gets in and seizes all this guy's stuff to stand good for the debt wins, and all the other creditors get nothing, right? And so what they invented was a formal way to say, no, I'm putting this person into insolvency, and now it needs to be doled out among everyone, right? Um But then in the United States, we have a really interesting history, which is that unlike almost anywhere else, we ended up with a ton of small landowners with a lot of democratic power in the West. And they owe a bunch of money back East for all the mortgages on their farms. And they don't really like that. And they think it's unfair. And they're very (laughs) angry about the the Eastern bankers. And so they get their senators when we finally get... So the the Constitution actually establishes the right to have a federal bankruptcy code, possibly because... Uh, Thomas Jefferson was on the verge he was, of bankruptcy he was when he died. Yeah, <laughs> he was not the only one of yeah. the founding fathers who had some uh, financial issues. Um, anyway, so it's in the Constitution, but we never had a permanent one until the late 1890s. I believe 1898 is the date. And what happens is all these Western senators get in and they they basically invent Chapter Seven, which is uh, so. There's basically two ways to declare personal bankruptcy, and one is. Um, Chapter 7, where what you own stands good for what you owe. You can protect your uh, you can protect your future income at the expense of all of your current assets with some things that are carved out, like your how, you know, some amount of home equity and like a car, some workman's tools, very popular. Um, and then there's chapter 13 where your future income, you get to protect your assets in order, but you have to give up some future income to repay the debt, right? Um, but so we basically invent this pro-debtor bankruptcy, which had never been a feature of bankruptcy law anywhere else and really wasn't anywhere else for a long, long time. And, and people are slowly in other places liberalizing. But it actually turns out for a couple of reasons it's really good. First of all, it's more efficient, right? It gives us an orderly process to wind these things down instead of creditors just rugby scrumming, um, trying to grab whatever they can. And the person who has the highest kind of seniority or what we would think of as the moral claim on the debt doesn't necessarily get it. But the other thing it does is that it frees people from their old bad decisions, right? And that's what's great about markets, right? Creative Joseph Schumpeter, creative destruction, is that you take stuff that didn't work and you throw it away and you start over. Or you salvage what you can, but you shut it down. You don't keep trying to do the same bad, stupid thing that right. didn't work before. Well, what I like about what you're saying here is that bankruptcy and our our bankruptcy policy is fundamentally a response to the leftist critique of the, of the market. It's about democratizing that power within our legal code, ordering our markets within that framework. But we should also talk about the current and emerging right critique of the market from the right. How are you? How do you see it? Through this lens, through a lens, and, and what is it that makes it fundamentally distinct from the leftist critique? And to provide some quick context, yeah. and I think that when we speak of the right, 
critique of the market we're talking about, oftentimes uh, Senator Josh Hawley, who's questioning the fact that for a long time the conservative movement and a lot of people at magazines just first things questioning the idea that conservatism is defined by a defense of the market. And they these critics allege that oftentimes that defense of the market caused conservatives to not prioritize other priorities such as the family, social stability, things such as that. So their critique, if, the way you might break it down, one way to look at it is that the left critique of the market is fundamentally about the market not valuing people and activities that the left thinks is important. Um, and that's actually also the right critique of the market, but what they value and think are important is different, right? The, the mm-hmm. right critique of the market is that it is disrupting, uh, it's disrupting family formation, right? And that is tends not to be a left critique even when people are right, making the left critique of, of gender pay differences, right? They're, it's fundamentally about the women, not about the kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and that it, it, for the, the right, it is much more about the ability to have lots of kids, not to have one or two and then have a high plot, blind career. Single earner but, families, yeah. Yeah. stuff like right. that. Um, but more that, that the market is disrupting folkways and value systems that the right values and that capitalism doesn't seem to have a lot of time for these days, right? And and so this is a critique about a lot about open borders and trade, um, about communities, about sexual standards, um, a whole variety of things that are, you know, and, and each conservative who has this critique is going to have a slightly different set of things that they're worried about, right? So there are social conservatives who don't care about um, migration and they're my, you know, anti-immigration people who don't care about social conservatism, gay marriage or whatever. But people are really worried about uh, what, what has now been dubbed woke capitalism, mm-hmm. right? Is this idea that the it's not just that capitalism is disruptive and doesn't care about your community and will sell out these old small towns that were holding together pretty well with a factory that's now been shipped to China or whatever. Um, it's also that these guys are actually going to side against you and they're going to try to use all of this economic power in order to browbeat you into going along. And the examples it. we should give here is, you know, the, the recent passage of abortion laws in, in some of the southern states and the decisions by major corporations to say, not only do we disagree with you, we are going to stop doing business in your state, yep. pressuring business leaders or uh, government, state government leaders to repeal such laws in order to placate this. We also saw this decision in Arizona with the Nike Corporation. Mm-hmm. And so these, you know, this has led to a feeling amongst people on the right that fundamentally is we cannot or that they cannot act in their belief without punishment by concentrated capital. No, and I, I think yeah. that I think that there's a desire to do that. I don't think yeah. they're wrong about that, mm. right? I mean, you mean I, I, like, what, what are they not wrong about? Sorry. I, I, there is a punitive strain on the left that is getting increasingly punitive where the idea is that they view religion especially as something like a hobby, right? And so when you say, well, no, I can't, like support gay marriage at my kid's school because it's a Orthodox Catholic school. They kind of hear that, or I can't perform abortions because I am an evangelical pro-life Christian, right? What they hear is like I can't perform abort, I can't provide this necessary health care because I'm a golfer, mm-hmm. right? Like it doesn't register. They don't understand religion as occupying a very special and different place from just lifestyle choices, right? And so that's part of it. Um, and there's also just a lot of bitterness and anger over all sorts of disputes where I, I've heard people say, like, no, you don't understand. These people have to be destroyed. Like, all of them just destroyed. Social cons- You mean the social, social conservatives. Mm-hmm. Trump voters, especially. Right. And, like, um, it's so not a not, healthy body politic. Right. Yeah. That is definitely not. And look, <laughs> but I think that that is actually kind of deluded conservatives into believing that this is more of a threat than, than it actually is. And a few examples, right? Look at Georgia, right? Georgia passes this very strict abortion law, and everyone, oh, we're not doing business in Georgia. Yeah, Hollywood's still doing business in Georgia. And you know why? First of all, because Georgia has a lot of really nice tax breaks for doing business in Georgia, if you were a movie studio uh, or a television company, production company. And second of all, because they now have, because they've 
had all this infrastructure. They have all this infrastructure. They have the people you need. They have, like, you can pull out and try to go somewhere else, but you're not going to have the experience. You're not going to have the continuity. Is The Walking Dead really going to pick up and move to another place after 10 years filming there? Probably mm-hmm. not. It's really disruptive. People buy houses. They, you know. Um, and so, in fact, not much is happening. This is just like... Hollywood gets gets to come out and say, oh, I would never do business in Georgia and then go do business in Georgia. The thing is, though, so fair. Like we, like, And I think if you actually went down the list of sort of the culture war flashpoints of the year, I think basically all of them would align with what you're suggesting. Well, I remember when Tim Cook came out against the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in Indiana. And I was like, what is – and people were freaking out. They were like, this is the end. And I was like, what is he going to do? Close the two Apple stores in Indiana? Right? Like, <laughs> what are you actually afraid to yeah. – he doesn't produce anything in Indiana well, or employ what, anyone but, in Indiana. What, what, I'm, what I'm getting at, though, then, is that the reason why this causes such a hullabaloo every time is because this is about something bigger in these specific incidents, right? So what this is about is the fact that if you're a conservative, if you're a Trump voter, especially in a red state – you have no control over their modern higher education system, especially at the elite levels. Um, if you're looking at the, you know, religion in terms of its power in public life has declined. Um, so if you're looking at the one thing that you thought was on your team, especially in the traditional Reaganite articulation of conservatism, it was supposed to be the free market. So when the major, major big corporations who for reasons of, I think a combination of actual alignment with like social liberalism, but also a degree of cynicism. That's where the woke capital critique sort of goes towards turns against the things you value. That leads you to conclude that, wait a second, the only thing that I actually could use to fight back against elite education, um, big Hollywood entertainment, and then basically corporations are the power of government. So you're seeing why limited government conservatism that would previously prioritize the market is less in favor. No, I get that. And I, I, I really, I'm sympathetic to this. I'm, I'm sounding maybe meaner to their case. Like I would, if I lived in Alabama, I would be very angry at the media too, right? Um, we have, as I wrote in a column, I don't know, six months ago, we have magically, the nationalization of the media has managed to give people who actually control the majority of state and federal governments the feeling of being powerless and mi- a, a microaggressed minority. And that's weird, but it's also true. And it's mm-hmm. because the centers of cultural production are so dominantly controlled by the left. But I would point out a few things. First of all, that those centers of cultural production um, are all having deep financial issues, right? Uh, the media is the most obvious example where newspapers are closing. And this is actually making the problem worse in the short term is that like now it used to be that newspapers, because it was hard to deliver newsprint, most people, and, and because when you were broadcasting a signal, you were limited by how far a, a broadcasting transmitter could reach. In a state, region, right? local yeah. area. Um, and especially if it's mountainous, not very far, right? And so each, you know, these, the news was tailored to local areas. And that's less and less the case. It's now the case that most of the news is getting produced in New York and Washington, D.C., and a little bit in California, and and like a tiny bit in Texas. Mm -hmm. And that's really it. And 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 that is a problem because the values of Washington, D.C. and California and Austin, Texas, are really different from the rest of the country. So just a quick pivot to the... I think as someone who was born in the 1990s, sort of seeing the... Oh, dear, you're so young. So young. (laughs) uh, The collapse of basically centrist, third-way, America's a center-right economy on the sort of Democratic Party side has been pretty quick. Like, I sort of don't remember when we started having a sort of Democratic Party where Democratic Socialists would be very successful. What is driving the adoption of at least socialistic languages on, on the left? Um, the cynical answer is that it is an oversupply of highly educated upper middle class children who cannot find jobs commensurate with their education. Um, you know, it, what's it, the nice answer? Well, that's that's <laughs> that's, that's that's probably right it's in terms of the media and cultural power that the DSA has. It's also but, actually yeah. right about the DSA if you mm-hmm. look at who they seem to be, it's a lot of super educated upper middle class people speaking for the working class. It's not that they don't have any working class members, right? But uh, there's a great article, and I can't remember where I saw it, that was on 
Um, and it, to be clear, the DSA is the Democratic Socialists yes. of America. Uh, it's a, a younger, I mean, it's a, a group that aligns itself with Senator Bernie Sanders, and, and they advocate, they're very specific about the Democratic uh, in right. their name. They liken it, themselves to FDR. It, but it is, it doesn't look like the old socialist movement, which really did come up through the trade unions, right? It, it looks like a very, very educated movement. And I, it's not to say they couldn't appeal to the working class, but I, I, do, I don't see evidence that they've got a big actual working class presence yet. What explains Senator Bernie Sanders then, right? Because Bernie Sanders... He will say himself he's been consistent on this issue for decades. Yeah. So is the fact that he's so successful now just that goes to your point about now there is a group of people who would very much be into his aesthetic? Well, I mean, there's an interesting thing about markets, right, is markets do this sometimes, right? If, the, if you think of politics as a market, and it kind of is, although the currency is not cash, right? It's like sometimes things that used to be popular, hush puppies, right? They they were loser shoes when I was growing up. And then suddenly in the 90s, they got super cool. And then they got uncool again, right? I mean, there it's a weird phenomenon. Public taste does this. So um, it was his moment. He had been doing the same thing all along. And like the stopped clock was eventually right for the moment. So do you think there's a possibility, though, that there's something about the economic conditions in our country? So separate from the sort of political fadism, right? Because I, I agree. I, I love the Hush Puppies example. But that suggests there's something sort of artificial or superficial. Is there something about the nature of America today? No, right. That's the, the whether it's, you know, higher so education. So these are the cynical answers. Yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> non-cynical <laughs> answer is that, look, productivity has been slowing down since the 1970s um and also the but i do actually think that looking at who becomes a socialist the pr- the lack of the the declining premium or it's not actually a declining premium there used to be a huge premium on a college degree and almost anyone who had one could collect it and now i think we've probably oversupplied the actual market for college degrees and so what has happened in that market is a couple of things. Is first of all, we've we've had more and more people chasing a fairly fixed number of jobs that benefit from a college education. Um, and so adding more people at the big end of the funnel doesn't make anyone happier at the small end of the funnel. What we've also done is in order to shove more people through the funnel, we've enabled people to finance their educations with debt. Um, and so... It's essentially like more and more like buying a lottery ticket. Unfortunately, there's no alternative, right? It's like buying lottery tickets is stupid because you could go take that money, put it in the stock market or in a government bond and on average, and basically <laughs> anything in your sock drawer, yeah. right? And you the expected, lose less to inflation the expected you would. value would be higher, yeah. right? But if there aren't any other good jobs, then buy the damn lottery ticket. And I think that's the situation where we are and that... The, and because this financing was available, colleges have been able to charge more and more. Basically, we've mo- borrowing allows you to move future income into the present. And if you think you can make a productive investment with it, it's a win-win, right? I borrow money, I buy a car, the car lets me get to uh, a better job, I double my salary, I can comfortably pay off the car, we're all better off, right? Um, but the problem is that what we've done is al- we've allowed people to time shift the college, the bonus for getting a college degree, and colleges themselves are consuming more and more of that bonus. Right. So while the bonus exists, you're paying out more and more of it in tuition and fees and then loan interest. I yeah. think I think this very much does catch on to the elite kind of signaling towards socialism. But we should note, I mean, Senator Bernie Sanders, is no, his number one donor is a Walmart worker. And I think that what that tells us you there— You mean like— like a person who works at Walmart, his, no, his he has a million donations, and the number one employer of his donors, like the majority, oh, okay. is are people who work at Walmart. Effen- essentially, people who like make minimum wage in this country, and I think that there that does tell us about a deep and a boiling dissatisfaction with the political system amongst our working class. Oh, I think that that's so. That's the other part of it, right? Right? Is that? But that has accompanied the fact, right? The reason the college degree premium keeps going up is not that like having a college degree is so much more fantastically lucrative and valuable than it used to be. It's that not having one is really kind of a desperate situation. And those workers, 
right? So the system isn't really working for anyone. And I think about my grandfather, and to go back to, you know, the market was made for man, not man for the market. My grandfather grew up on a dirt farm in Western New York, basically grew up with nothing. Um, then the Great Depression hit. He had to quit high school to stay at home and help his dad on the farm because they were about to lose the farm. He worked a, after that. He sort of got over that. He did manage to graduate from high school um, by going back. But then he worked as a grocery boy on the deal until he was 26. Right. And then he bought a gas station and he did pretty well. And he was a successful small businessman in a small town and had a great life. And that path, my cousins who are still in that town, that path is not open to them. It doesn't feel open to them. It doesn't feel like basically everyone had a pretty good job and they were pretty stable and, you know, you could count on things. No one there feels like they can count on anything unless they work for the government. And that is a real shift in the way society works for people who don't have college degrees and not everyone can get a college degree. And there's a real sense in DC, the kind of D.C. New York axis that to say someone isn't smart enough to get a four-year B.A. is to say that they're not as valuable, to say that they are lesser people. And I think that's wrong. But I think, I think that's a critique of the market, though. But fundamentally if, yeah, wrong. The right. The market, no, I, and, and that, this is that the, leads to the valuation of right. people based on their. <laughs> this is the critique. But is it really a critique of the market? So what I, what I would note is that a lot of this has come through H.R., which in its in turn is doing what it does um, often just to shield itself from legal liability, right? You don't have to explain why you didn't hire someone if you required a BA and they didn't have one. You don't have to explain decisions, right? The more you systematize decisions, the less legal liability you have because it's, uh, it's a rule. So is I this a consequence of our legal regime or is this a it? consequence of just corporatism. It is a it is a consequence of a lot of things, right? And part of it is market driven. Don't get me wrong. Um, part of it is the way that finance has centralized, which has made it harder to for you know to get capital in small towns. Part of it is like, but look, part of it is also the St. Lawrence Seaway. Canada opened it in 1959, and that was bad for Western New York, and it's been in continuous decline ever since, right? Um, and part of it is that air conditioning made the South just relatively more attractive to small towns in the North. And part of it is that New York State's tax regime um, basically is designed for a downstate region that throws off so much cash from these creative and financial industries that they can afford to have a really expensive and inefficient government. They can. right? And so this is like both my libertarian critique and concession which is that it's not going to drive New York City into the ground if their unemployment regime is really expensive, um, if their government workers are really expensive, if their taxes just disincentivize business creation. Because, in fact, they, the, those global industries throw off so much cash. But if you're in western New York and you aren't in an industry like that, and if you're trying to compete on a tradable good like manufacturing, you're, you're hosed in New York State. And that's actually, so part of it is, a lot of these are government stories. There's a lot of different stories. But the problem is, you know, if you're a worker at Walmart and the only job in your town is Walmart, you can't necessarily see. I'm not arguing that I can see. I don't know all the reasons that this has happened, mm -hmm. right? You can't see that. What you can see is these gross metrics. And Bernie Sanders comes in and says, and you can see that you are afraid that you're not going to be able to afford health care for your kid. You can see that you're afraid of losing your job. You can see that working at Walmart is not really that much fun and not really that satisfying. And you would really like something better for your kids. And you have no idea how to get it for them because their local school isn't that good. But also, they're frankly not the sort of people who were ever going to enjoy sitting down and getting and, and studying, you know, English literature for four years. Mm -hmm. So to tie a bow on this, why are they? Why is socialism not the answer to respond to the concerns, legitimate concerns of these people? Um, because social, it, I mean, it might fix some problems. Like if you don't like working at Walmart, then if there were no Walmart, you wouldn't have to work there. But you might be miserable because there wasn't anywhere else to work either, right? And and so one example of this is in West. I'll go back to Western New York. It's fifteen dollar minimum wage, right? Well, again, New York City can pretty much afford that. It 
some restaurants are going to close, but it's not going to be a holocaust. It's a dynamic market mm-hmm. they could figure But like out. licensed practical nurses only make a couple bucks more an hour than that in western New York. So wait, now someone flipping burgers at McDonald's is going to is going to be making the same as someone who is doing vital healthcare work and also had to go to school for a considerable period of time to learn how to do this job. That's uh, you know, and and so that's part of the problem is that to make a national solution for anything um, is going to have actually really disproportionate effects on these regions where a lot of the Bernie Sanders voters are. Um, but also, look, he's promising, he's making really unrealistic promises in ways that just aren't that clear to people. And I, I go, so my mother, right? My mother is a very educated, very bright woman. Um, but and she has a daughter who writes about healthcare policy. And when I try, when I try to convince her that there's no easy fix for the healthcare system, that it's not like some big conspiracy that no one understood. Everyone understands kind of what needs to happen, and everyone also understands that there's no political will to do what would need what to needs happen. To yeah, what needs to happen? Um, so the biggest reason that American healthcare costs so much uh, is that our prices are higher, and the biggest reason that our prices are higher. Some of it's administrative costs, although that's labor, right? That's someone's mm-hmm. job. But a lot of it is that we pay our healthcare workers way more than people in other countries, right? And if you're going to go to a nurse and say, well, yeah, you've got a really solid middle class living making $65,000, $80,000 for a registered nurse right now, um, some, sometimes more, right? Um, but you know what? We've got to cut our prices. So now you make $40,000 like your counterparts in France. Right, <laughs> that's gonna be that's gonna be a hard conversation. Um, it would be catastrophic for a lot of people who've say taken on a mortgage under the assumption that they could repay it from their salary. For regional healthcare centers, where that's often the big employer, you look at a city like Pittsburgh, someplace like Buffalo with Strong Memorial. You look at a lot of these Rust Belt cities. What's left is the hospital. This is the regional hospital center. So if you're going to cut all those wages, it's not even like there's going to be anywhere else to sell your house to, right? Oh, well, just downsize. Well, no, actually, everyone else, the the engine of the economy just all got the same pay cut. Um, So that's one big problem. Um, Another big problem is that a lot of the stuff that we tried to do to fix the system and Obamacare just didn't work uh, to fix overtreatment incentives and so forth. A third problem is that we built our hospitals differently in ways that we can't undo. So when Medicare comes along, really the reason that American healthcare costs are so high is Medicare. Medicare was just like a fiesta for 20 years, between 1965 and about about 1983, so not quite 20 years. Uh, It's just a fiesta for every provider, every local government, every hospital. They just went to town on reasonable and customary fees. Mm Right. Um, And so what happens is doctor incomes rise a lot. Hospital incomes rise a lot. But the hospitals use the money to build new hospitals. The United States healthcare system costs so much. Not like everyone wants to believe. It's not a conspiracy, like you said. (laughs) But everyone also wants to believe that it's like drug manufacturers and insurers because everyone hates drug manufacturers and insurers. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And they hate them weirdly because those are the only two parts of the system where they're actually exposed to substantial costs. right? Right. We pay our premiums. We pay for our prescription drugs, and so we hate these guys. We love our doctors because our doctors are just nice, and they don't take <laughs> – they just take, like, a little copay from us. And they, no, actually, your doctor is taking all the money you're giving your insurer, but right. it's not visible to people. That's that's really interesting, just about the, the lack of, over, of insight into the system and how that can breed – our different political choices. And I would say, too, that this is a a thing. Why have markets, why did socialism become popular in the 19th century? Why is it coming back now? Why did all of these critiques of the market? Because markets are bigger and they're less transparent. They're less comprehensible, right? If you are a farmer in, in, you know, a medieval peasant taking your food to market, you can basically understand how that market works. If a lot of people grew apples this year and there's a lot of apples, the price will be low. If you were one of the lucky few, the price will be high. It's, it's, it's legible. Yeah. And markets are no longer, most markets are just no longer legible to people. And the and ironic thing is they still work. And that they still your work. Point. It's they, kind they, of amazing, they, they, right? It, it, the system seems infinitely more complicated, but it's still able to do the basic right. functions. But to the actual person who's experiencing that market, 
it seems to not work. So this is the flip side of that Hayek thing, yeah. right? Is mm-hmm. that as if by magic, the resources are reallocated, <laughs> but then we feel we have no, no control over it. And it's why people are afraid of flying, even though driving is more dangerous. Yeah. It's because at least in a car, you feel like you could do something. Right. Well, I think that this is actually is a decent segue to journalism because it's the same type of force where people look around and they see that their papers are closing and they have to see, they say, okay, well, those papers were all sustained by advertising. All that advertising dollars now flow to Facebook and Google. Ergo, Facebook and Google is bad. And that's something that that Bernie Sanders has come out with a new plan. Marshall, we should... Yeah, and and basically the the quick way to sum up the plan is that, and the framework he's approaching as his plan as a political move is that these tech companies, which basically everyone is beating down on tech companies right now, um, are basically taking up so much ad revenue that used to sustain newspapers, now that they don't have the classified section or the geographic monopoly that you talked about earlier, we should tax them over this advertising. Um, and we should concentrate and use that tax and use that tax revenue to support local journalism and to support nonprofits. Basically, have the government play a role in shaping this market. What do you think about the plan? Uh, well, right. So first of all, what destroyed local news is not Google and Facebook. It's bad. Don't get me wrong, but it's worse for magazines. What destroyed local news was uh, Craigslist, yeah. which you notice he does not plan to tax because it's a nonprofit and he loves nonprofits. And, you know, Craig Newmark didn't mean to do anything bad to journalism. He just accidentally created a more efficient way. Right. Than, uh, and actually, Pla- a newspaper could have created a Craigslist. Yeah. They uh, easily could have done Classified yeah. ads used to be 50 percent of newspaper revenue and now they're basically zero percent of newspaper revenue right i mean you guys are too young to remember but i when i looked for my first job out of college what you did every day you got up you got the new york times um and you opened it and you went to help wanted and you circled all of the ads and then you phoned all of the people it was uh we're taxmonster.com too then (laughs) 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 we're we're adding up the list um but this is that's what changed and so look um I think it's a problem that Facebook and Google have taken our ad revenue. And be, and I think it's a problem in a lot of dimensions. It's partly that I have a fondness for the old model of journalism, which was tried to be neutral, and that's going away. Um, and I think that that is related to the fact that we are now going to be dependent on subscribers. And subscribers get angry when you don't As, take it. Yeah. You, can't, you, can't, you can't be a paper of record when you're beholden to a uh, subscriber base which hold a behemoth of political, like one and political all of media. the things that left-wing media, yeah. can, that, that the mainstream media, which does lean extraordinarily left, right? Um, all of the things they complain about in right-wing media, they are going to mirror because they're going to be dependent on people who want to hear their all of their biases confirmed. Because if you're selling ads to Macy's in the local, in the local downtown, Macy's by definition wanted centrism. They wanted non-controversial things but you can also you can already see this right you can see it happening um both within the newsroom i mean you when when you look at what happened with the new york times over you know there were headlines and an angry town meeting with staff and staff were like no we have to call everything racist because racism everything in america is about racism right and that's i'm not debating whether that proposition Mm -hmm. is true or not i'm just saying like that is a proposition that is appealing to, to a certain percentage a of the certain demographic, who which live in is certain the, the, the New York Times readership <laughs> and their writership. Um, but it's going to really alienate a lot of other people uh, unless it is phrased way more carefully than that staffer phrased it, even for internal consumption. Mm-hmm. Um, I have actually tried to, I've, I, I have made it part of my life's work to convince conservatives that systemic racism exists. So, yeah. <laughs> no, from it, a gentle <laughs> and friendly rather than like you are a bunch of racist trolls perspective, because I think it does exist. And I think conservatives actually can understand it because all of the stuff they complain about liberal media and academia is all microaggressions and structural bias, mm. right? So it's actually all, you, you, you already have the tools, guys, um, <laughs> to understand why this is a problem. And I think that's a problem in both cases, but I think it's kind of inevitable because that's, you know, Fox doesn't do what it does. I mean, the interesting thing, right, is the number of people on the left who blamed like right-wing talk radio and Fox News 
for making Trump happen. And if you talk to the people who are inside, they're like, no, other way around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like the people who tried to stand against Trump's followers were just smashed by their own viewership or listenership. Right. So in, in that sense, like the, the audience was leading what happened, and that is also going to happen at the mainstream media. I think the thing that concerns me, too, and this goes into the earlier topic you're making about the nationalization of everything. So I think that I used to work at PBS. I like public funding of media. But I think part of the danger here is that trust levels in PBS and NPR and basically all these sort of institutions in an era of nationalized politics have collapsed. People do not – the NPR and PBS are no longer sort of Sesame Street and it's Arthur and it's great and we love it. It's actually seen through partisan lenses. So part of my concern with the Bernie Sanders plan is that when you actually have a system where the government is very much saying we are now going to fund all news, it's going to create a situation where trust levels will collapse even further. Well, but also like think about the mechanism, right? Are these appointed positions? Exactly. So every time a new administration comes in, it used to be like for, – so for, for eight years, the – the, it was the Democrats were putting their thumbs on the scale for their guys, and now for eight years it's going to be the Republicans putting the thumbs on the scale for. Yeah, this it, is a terrible. It idea. misaligns all the incentives. It's just, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible idea in the United States where we just don't. First of all, we don't have like the civil service that say Britain does. What's interesting, Megan, is that Josh Hawley is also yes. looking at this from a. A similar but a different angle, which in a is very wearing his bad idea jeans. <laughs> um, it's he's taking on or he's proposing in a recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that there have not been any big innovations out of technology in approximately a decade. This goes to a Peter Thiel's, in which we mentioned on this podcast before, that we were promised the Star Trek universe, but all we actually got was the Star Trek computer. We didn't get flying cars or replicators or any of these things. Now Holly's proposal here on a journalistic level, is to go after Facebook and Google for, mis for, I guess, in his words, misappropriating advertising dollars away from productive enterprises or socially productive enterprises like journalism. Why is that not the concern or the case for that we should take? For the same reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that, like, look, I would love to have a government bureaucrat decide that my salary was a matter of vital national importance. <laughs> um, but... And I actually think it's, uh, journalism fulfills a really socially important function. But there are many socially important functions that I don't want the government to take over. Parenting is a very socially important function. And as it turns out with foster homes, the government is just not a very good substitute for parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question again is, look, I, I think that ultimately Josh Hawley is – he has noticed correctly that Silicon Valley is unfriendly to conservatives and particularly to culturally conservatives. Um, and he's going after them. And I actually predicted this would happen. And I've been predicting it would happen for years now. Uh, not happily. But that doesn't mean I think it's justified. Hmm. Right? It was kind of obvious to me that Silicon Valley had bet on the wrong horse. What horse did they bet on? Um, this look, is like the Google Obama era. Yeah. yeah. They... they they tied themselves really, really tightly to Democrats. And that was a mistake. Even if you think that Democrats are right about everything, I don't think that, but even if you think that, visibly tying yourself to Democrats, the Democrats now want Silicon Valley's head for a bunch of reasons, like Russia and um, you know, the fake news and, and also privacy. They're really, really, really concerned about privacy, more, I think, than any actual voters are concerned about privacy. But the mm. 10 people who care about this issue care about it a lot. <laughs> no, I mean, really, like, the, the fact is, why did Equifax happen? Because no one cares enough mm. to lock down their data. It's free. You can lock your credit report. No one can access it. It doesn't cost you anything. No one does it. Why? Because then when you apply for a cell phone, it's a real pain in the butt to, yeah. to unfreeze your credit report, right? Um, and so the fact is we don't value privacy very much. Um, but Democrats are going to come after them, and now they have made very sure that Republicans are also going to come after them because it is very clear that, in fact, there is a pretty sizable contingent in, in these firms that views Republicans as troglodytes who should be cleansed from the face of the earth, um, that they will – 
if given the chance, use their power to actually make that happen in the little narrow realms in which they exert power. So they will shut down your, you know, they will shut down right wing Twitter accounts faster than they will shut down left wing Twitter accounts that are doing the same thing, Uh, which is not to say, you know, conservatives can get paranoid on this point of view. Like I've had people who got shut down for saying that they wanted to kill me and so forth. Mm. Um, So it does happen to people on the left who were clearly on the left because there is, in fact, this increasingly intolerant left-wing orthodoxy that really wants to kind of unperson those who are guilty of wrong think. Where I think people are mistaken is way overestimating the power that they have to make this happen. Um, Way underestimating the costs of their proposed solutions. And I think that this is also true of Bernie Sanders. He is just way underestimating the cost of using the government to support the media. Because ultimately Republicans are going to end up back in charge of it, Bernie. And do you want like eight years of state-sponsored media on how climate change is a hoax and Project all the Project Veritas, we got a lot of nonprofit funding. <laughs> or a pro-life organization. Imagine right. If, uh, do you want it? Do you want like every time there's an administration change, the editorial policy of basically all of the local newspapers in the country changes? That's insane. So this speaks to, I think, what we'll wrap up with is that we've described a lot of the challenges that capitalism is facing, whether on the cultural side, but also on the sort of technological innovation side. How do you think in this moment, the basics, I, I don't want to say stewards because it sounds a little too like specific, but the people, whether those are tech company heads, whether those are people who work on Wall Street, people within the conservative center right space in D.C. who see themselves as defending the system, what do they need to do? So I will say this to everyone, is that people should spend a lot less time looking for government solutions and a lot more time looking for institutional solutions. Right, I think about this with conservatives, this happens to be in my mind, you know, they're complaining that like, can, that, that liberals control academia and they control Hollywood and so forth. Well guys, how about making some movies that are socially conservative and actually good, unlike the not very good product of uh, Christian movie making, mm. where even the, even the Babylon Bee is like, <laughs> I love mm. Christian movies because they allow me to get everything I love in a movie except for quality and mm. cussing, right? <laughs> and that's basically true is that, you know, don't fund people to make sermons with a cast. Fund people who happen to be conservative and want to do art. That's how you actually get butts in seats. That's how you actually change the culture in the way that Hollywood has very successfully changed the culture. It is a long-term project, and it's going to require some interest in actually not instrumentally funding movies that preach what you want people to preach, but funding people who already kind of agree with you and are going to go out and make art just based on their their life premises about the world, right? Um, Similarly, academia. If you only fund academics to study specific things and have specific opinions, you're not going to get as good work as if you just fund people who are interesting and creative and interested in exploring the world and they don't know what answer they're going to get. And that's how universities got where they are. Conservatives need more of that and less, look, I love think tanks, valuable Right, people should fund think tanks, but we all the conservatives should also be funding just open-ended research into topics that they're interested in. Fund diplomatic and military history, which no one is doing because they're viewed as conservative. Don't fund a result; just fund someone to do that kind of history. Right, that's the sort of thing that could make a real big difference over again over time. But on the left too, right. All of this stuff about UBI and healthcare and so forth. You know universal what? basic income. Universal UBI. basic income. Um, and and Medicare for all and so forth. I'm not saying that these don't appeal to some some portion of the electorate. But like no one cares about anything as much as having a job. This is really true even in, in countries with very good social insurance. Right, is ultimately if you look at what makes people the most unhappy, more unhappy than being widowed. Like, if you get widowed or divorced, your happiness kind of recovers after about five years. If you're still unemployed after five years, you're still just as, basically just as unhappy as you were the day you were fired uh, or laid off. And so, you know, talking, it's fine to do redistribution. 
we can argue about how much and so forth. But like, I'm not arg- trying to argue you out of that point if you were on the left. What I am arguing is that it's not nearly enough. And that all of the left's energy is going into like moving the columns, figures from column A to column B. Right? And that's not a life. A life is a rich community life where you feel valued and you feel like you're contributing. Right? It's not just about what you can consume. And I think both left and right really made this error over the last 30 years is they forgot people care way more about themselves as workers than as consumers. We care way more about feeling that we are valued than in being able to procure objects of value. And so the left needs to actually focus on ways to create communities of meaning that aren't about political organizing. But this is also true with the right. What does the right have? Tax cuts. Tax cuts are not giving us a sustaining, uh, exciting future, right? They are, they are giving us more money in our pocket right now, but they are not the be-all and end-all of policy, and Republicans have made it that. And I think that in many ways, both parties are just repeating themselves and have been for a decade. The Republicans really have been since Ronald Reagan. Um, and that what's missing is my, my father grew up going to like democratic parties, right? The, the political club lay on top of a rich community life and was sustaining that community life, right? The local political operation was a place where you went to award dinners for the guy who'd been a member of the club for 25 years and so forth, right? That stuff is gone and it's gone for both left and right. And if we want to bring it back, it's going to require us to do more than send a check to Washington. And it's going to require us to do more than sit around reading articles, getting mad at Donald Trump, and having a lot of really solemn thoughts about about what little levers we should tweak. It's going to require getting out into our communities and coming face to face with people who aren't like us and actually not even figuring out what to give them, figuring out who they are, being their neighbor. That's really, I think, in the end, where a lot of this has gone wrong. And and that's the stuff that we need to fix. Well, I think what you really are calling for is actual innovation in both parties, which is the (laughs) true free market defense. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us, Megan. We really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed the episode. As always, please rate us five stars and subscribe to The Realignment wherever you listen to your podcast. If you particularly enjoyed Megan's conversation, you can find her at Asymmetric Info on Twitter, and you can find her work in The Washington Post. See you next week.